my subspecialty is urogynecology. I worked a lot for, in Egypt here in urogynecology. And uh, previously, I hated this chapter when I was studying for the exam. I hated this chapter because I cannot imagine anything. I cannot understand anything. So urodynamics, some of our friends said before, urodynamics, if you, if you understand the principles, you will love it. You will fall in love with this chapter and actually the practical work as well. If you cannot achieve understanding to the principles, you will suffer a lot. So let's make it more easy in this one hour session, free session. Uh, I will give all of you the principles of the Eurodynamics and Eurological problems and uh, the keys. How can you understand the NICE guideline who is talking about the urinary incontinence problems which have been updated uh, recently, 2018. It had been updated recently in, I think, August or September 2018. Uh, very, very minimal change, okay, from the previous edition. And we will ex give you an example here for the, these changes. The urinary incontinence, which is the topic of today, is one of major problems in uh, UK. For our friends who are working in Gulf area or in Egypt here, or maybe uh, India, I don't know what is the rate of vaginal delivery there. But in Gulf area and uh, in, in Egypt particularly, the rates of cesarean section is very high. And cesarean section almost not associated with development of urinary incontinence and prolapse problems. So in UK, because they are stressing too much on vaginal delivery, the rates of urinary problems prolapsed, pelvic organ prolapse is always higher and these complications are raised up in incidence and prevalence all of the time. So the need for urodynamic surgeons and urodynamic substitutes will be always high. The problem is you have to understand certain points, then you can build up your mind towards the urinary incontinence. The, the word incontinence is meaning involuntary leakage of urine. Involuntary leakage of urine. We have a three types of urinary incontinence. If you have a paper and pen, just do three arms and we will fulfill together these arms such a comparison. The moment of incontinence in UK Europe is stress urinary incontinence. It counts about 50%. The overactive bladder, the new name actually, which had been known previously as urge incontinence, counts about 20%. And the so there's a disturbance with the wall. Sorry. There's a disturbance in your voice, sir. Oh, any questions? Dr. Josephine, I can see your name talking. So uh, yes, would you sir. like to add anything or to ask about anything? Yes. Nothing, sir. Okay, perfect. So, Dr. Niha is asking about. Voice is not clear. Not clear. The voice. Okay. So, let me check a few points and I will be there again. 
Is the voice is clear? Because I have a full signal, actually. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, um, yeah, this is the simple classification. Please just draw three arms and try to fulfill these arms right now with me. So the first question is, what is the problem in each type? Basically, stress urinary incontinence is due to anatomical abnormality. The anatomical abnormality is the abnormal descent. Dr. Rokaya, please close the mic. The, uh, the abnormal descent of bladder neck due to weakness of the pelvic floor muscles is the main cause of stress urinary incontinence. So the problem is anatomical. While in the urge incontinence or overactive bladder, the problem as function that the closer muscle or the muscle, the bladder wall is becoming insane. She's very irritated and contracted It's a basic information knowledge that this, the, the anatomical abnormality should be corrected by surgery and the functional problems should be corrected or controlled medically. So, first management of stress urinary incontinence should be surgical while the first line management of overactive bladder should be medical. Okay. Somebody will ask me, first line is lifestyle modification. Basically, lifestyle modification. So I tell you, for the UK practice and for them, Lifestyle modification in gynecology is considered the core treatment step for 99% of different conditions. Please try to search about menopausal symptoms, PMS, okay, subfertility problems, urogynecological problems, okay, chronic pelvic pain, everything. You will find that the core treatment is lifestyle modification which includes what? Stop caffeine, smoke, mild exercise, mild to moderate so exercise, your voice is stress really relief. Cute. Sorry? Your voice is breaking, sir. The signal Can you isn't repeat? Clear. The signal isn't clear in between, sir. Is this a problem with all of Yes, sir. Yes, even yes, I sir. cannot hear. Yes, sir. Yes, I even I cannot hear. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Simple.
Now I, I think the problem is settled. I'm all right. Hello. Yes, sir, you're clear. Yeah, now it's yes, perfect. Sir, uh, I yes, changed sir, the whole, clear. Yeah, okay. It's perfect. I, I changed the whole uh, uh, network, so I changed to another one. <laughs> always, always okay, you sir. should have a, you should have a plan B. I think so. Thank you. Sir. <laughs> In life. Yeah. Thank you so much for waiting and patience. So I will start again from the beginning. Uh, just, just give me one second to start the show, and we will discuss again the urogynecology. Just we said uh, uh, that it's a very important chapter, and actually, yeah, uh, okay. perfect. Uh, I will join right now. So they okay, and we have a three types: the stress urinary incontinence, which the problem is essentially, essentially anatomical, due to abnormal, uh, uh, abnormal descent of the bladder neck, due to muscle weakness of the pelvic floor, either by menopause or by uh, repeated vaginal deliveries. Complicated vaginal delivery, such as instrumental delivery or operative vaginal delivery, or the history, or the history, yeah, or the history of uh, previous prenatal tears or so, other other causes. So, uh, yeah, I imagine the problem in the um, overactive bladder is functional. Abnormal detrusor muscle contractions and hypersensitivity. Definitely, the problem is due to uncontrolled contractions. Okay, uncontrolled contractions. So uh, this will be the main problem. In the mixed urinary incontinence, which counts about 30% of the conditions of incontinence, the problem is very query. Sometimes the patient may suffer from mixed symptoms. Uh, uh, mixed symptoms of the stress incontinence, like leakage of urine due to increased intra-abdominal pressure, either with laughing, sneezing, lifting heavy objects, or frequency, urgency, and nocturia, which compatible more with the overactive bladder. Okay. Can hear now. Can see. Wow. Because I'm waiting until the uh, the uh, yeah until they make me the presenter. <laughs> I'm waiting until make me the presenter so that I can uh, I can show the slides. Okay. Can please. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, okay. So uh, they will make me a presenter right now. Just a few seconds, please. Okay, just I send, I drop them a message and they will uh, make me the presenter right now to be able to show the slides as well. Uh, okay, if we continue until they show being able to uh, um, 
discuss the risk factors. Yeah, I ask it. Yeah, I ask it too many times. Please, all people, check your mics are muted, because sometimes you may uh, uh, not notice that, and it will influence the clarity of the voice and everything. So uh, please, all of you, check that. If we, yeah, okay. If we, uh, thank you. If we discuss together what are the possible risks or causes or the problem, yeah, it will be Dr. Manal. Dr. Manal is Zain. Close the mic. Uh, thank you in advance. So, uh, yeah, we discussed it. it it's, it's maybe in the stress urinary incontinence, uh, any, any trauma to the pelvic floor muscles, any history of complicated delivery and menopause always play a great role in atrophic vaginitis and atrophic of vaginal and urethral mucosa. So sometimes with menopausal women and picture of atrophy, the treatment is very simple. It's just to apply estrogen vaginal cream and wait. Okay. The overactive bladder causes is unexplained and also the risk factors are uh, uh, very query. You cannot depend on that. Sometimes it may be associated with autoimmune diseases or sometimes with stress patients, very stressed patients. And those who are associated symptoms uh, with inflammatory bowel syndrome or an irritable bowel problems. So this is regarding the risk factors. I'm always trying to be very systematic. And this attitude you should follow, either in part two or in part three. The only way to cover all points and to remember everything is to be very systematic. So the pathophysiology, the risk factors or causes, and then the uh, the clinical picture, investigations and examination, and management plan. Okay, this is the ideal, the ideal way to remember everything. Uh, yeah, Dr. Sidra is talking to me right now. So, so just a second. No, I need to be a presenter. Okay. She will manage perfectly. Uh, okay. The clinical... Yeah, I was sorry. I was talking to Dr. Sidra because uh, she will she will enter the session now and manage the problem. So that's why I have to close the mic. Now the voice is 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 good. I think yes. Okay. So. Uh, yeah, we were talking about the possibilities of symptoms, our wide range symptoms. Increasing the intra-abdominal pressure, increasing the intra-abdominal pressure will simultaneously associated with increase the intravesical pressure. The detrosor muscle, if it's normal, should adapt with increasing intravesical pressure. This is a function of accommodation and adaptation. Medically, 
This point is called compliance. The bladder is a compliant is a compliant uh, uh, organ. It's like a lung. It can accommodate more and more spaces. Okay. In the case of, in the case of uh, uh, increasing intra-abdominal pressure and descent of the neck of bladder, the valvular mechanism, the valvular mechanism of the of the urethra is not working well. So simply, droplets will pass through involuntarily due to the laws of valvular mechanism of the urethra. This is the major problem in the stress urinary incontinence. So let's go through the detrosor instability or overactive bladder. The problem is involuntary irritable contractions of, of the uh, Uh, hello? 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 Yes, sir. You're audible, sir. Yes, sir. So, so where is the problem? Why? Can why? You, why? I can see some of our friends say no voice. So, I can uh, hear you, sir. Yeah, I say. You can I hear. Can. Okay. So, uh, yes, okay. So the overactive bladder, the detrosor muscle cannot comply and cannot do its work. So the patient could not carry large amounts of urine. So the patient simply will suffer from frequency. She wants to go to the toilet many, many times per day. Sometimes she cannot control herself until going to the toilet. This is an urgency. And urgency is the commonest associated problem with overactive bladder. Okay. In few cases, the woman may suffer also from nocturia. The definition of nocturia includes more than three times at night going to the toilet to evacuate. It means it means that um, the patient may wake up from her sleep and go into the toilet three times or more. This is the definition of nocturia. What shall we do to those patients? Simply, we need to do some investigations. And the investigations according to the NICE guideline is Basic investigations should be offered to all women and specific investigations specific investigations should be done to a certain conditions. Okay? To we have the slide, please. Yes. The slide, yeah, the show is back right now. Perfect. So let's go from the current slide. Yeah. Uh -huh. These are the investigations or basic investigations all of you should follow to all patients in neurodynamic problems. The bladder diary is basic investigation. It's a paper and it will be carried out for three days by the woman. You will ask the woman to fulfill this paper. What is the amount of fluids, the nature of fluids? How many times she went to the toilet? How many times she woke up at night to go to the toilet? Okay, the frequency, if there is any attacks of leakage, caffeine, nicotine, everything, it will be recorded in the bladder diary so that we can estimate 
if we need to make a fluid chart restriction or to change the type of fluids the woman is usually take. Bladder diary is the initial investigation for any woman, as well as midstream urine analysis. Because in midstream urine analysis, we need to exclude two major problems. The first one is urinary tract infections. And the Voice second is one, very low. I'm not here. Voice is very low. Hello? Still low? No, now it is okay. It's because it's because okay, my, I, I, I think the mic in, in, inside my mouth. <laughs> so it's very difficult to be very low. So uh, yeah, is it, is it fine right now? It's perfect. Okay. 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 Yeah, perfect. Okay. So uh, yeah, the midstream urine analysis is the second classic investigation to any woman suffering from uh, uh, urinary symptoms to exclude urinary tract infection, which is very similar in symptoms as the overactive bladder. The patient with UTI would suffer from frequency, sometimes urgency, but there is a major keyword in UTI diagnosis. It's a burning micturation, burning micturation. Very classic and characteristic finding with UTIs, okay? So uh, the third investigation is the post-void residual volume. The post-void residual volume is um, referring to the amount of urine after evacuation of the bladder by the, by the woman herself so that we can estimate if there is a, a problem with voiding function which is called avoiding difficulties or it may be associated with some obstruction levels through the pathway of the urine. So post void residual volume should never exceed 50 milli after complete evacuation. It could be measured either by insertion of catheter and collect the remaining urine or by ultrasound scan. Ideally, and for exam, you choose ultrasound scan directly because it's less invasive, less risky for infection initiation, and very effective as well. So this is the best option to evaluate post-void residual volume. If the post-void residual volume is higher than 50 milli, the condition is voiding difficulties. And then later, we will discuss the varieties of voiding difficulties and how can we manage. So this is the basic investigations. What are the specific investigations? The specific investigations will be discussed in details in the Eurodynamics and Eurogynecology session in the regular course, but you should know that the uh, specific investigations include Eurodynamic studies, cystoscopy in certain conditions. The Eurodynamic study is not routinely required for any woman suffering from incontinence. The indications of urodynamics includes, anybody knows? Because I need all of you to share with me. Anybody knows what are the indications? Just, just say one indication. And we will discuss before, the whole thing. Before surgery for SUI. Excellent. Before any surgery, either in, before SUI surgical management or before surgical interventions for OEB. Excellent. Before doing any procedure, you should do uh, uh, urodynamics. So these three investigations mentioned are for all types of incontinence. For any woman suffering from urinary incontinence, you should do the three basic investigations. Okay. What are the 
other in, 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 other indications for urodynamics. Let me let me say that a woman with query diagnosis, like mixed incontinence, the woman giving this the both symptoms of OEB and SUI. I can't I can't be sure what is the problem. So I will do urodynamics. Okay. The woman with anterior significant compartment prolapse. If the woman suffering from SUI or urinary incontinence and there is a respectable cystocele, I mean grade two, grade three cystocele, not grade one, significant cystocele. So this means urodynamics should be done. Why? Because the major problem in correction of SUI problems due to the descent of the neck of bladder is sometimes overcorrection may be there. So the patient will suffer from obstruction. She will suffer from voiding difficulties forever. So the urodynamics will reveal earlier if the woman had a problem with voiding of we may then change the, the, the idea. We may then change our plans and management. Number four in the indications of urodynamics. Recurrent symptoms after surgery. Recurrent symptoms after surgery. So we can notice that urodynamics is not routinely requested. Because in Egypt here, for example, any woman suffering from Burning micturation, go and do urodynamics. Incontinence, urodynamics. If she is even she, if she is normal and not complaining from anything, go and do urodynamics. They love urodynamics in Egypt here. But in UK, urodynamic should be requested in certain conditions. The cystoscopy is the another particular investigation and should be done in certain conditions. What are the indications of cystoscopy? Hematuria. Hematuria, sir? Yeah, micro and macro hematuria. Yes. Hematuria. More than 50 years? Excellent. Sorry? More than 50 years is hematuria. Yes. Postman. Yes. Suspicion of malignancy. Yes. Painful bladder syndrome. Yes. Anybody would like to add anything from the curriculum, the whole curriculum? So, in vesicovaginal fistula and urethrovaginal fistula. True. Yes. With fistula diagnosis and management. Anybody else? Anybody would like to think? Let me say this because it's somehow far away. Cystoscopy is a part of staging of cancer cervix. Okay? Staging of cancer cervix. So these are the indications of cystoscopy. Now we need to manage rapidly the lifestyle modification or the lifestyle change as we discussed including modification of fluid intake, loss of weight, reduce caffeine, mild to moderate exercise, and uh, if there is any source of infection, treat it. This is the lifestyle modification and should be applied as primary management, either with the SUI or with OEB. This is the basic management. Okay, so let's jump to primary management of SUI particularly. What is the problem in SUI? The problem is weakness in the pelvic floor muscles. So the treatment requires strengthen of the pelvic floor muscles. So pelvic floor muscle exercise considered as primary management with lifestyle modification. The pelvic floor muscle exercise is recommended with physiotherapist for three months, eight contractions 
three times daily for three consecutive months. Okay? Then we need to evaluate the patient and what, are, what is the degree of improvement. Next, if the pelvic floor muscle exercises failed to manage, next, surgical management directly because the problem is anatomical. Surgical management was including sling operations, TVTs. Uh, the TVT was previously the ideal first line option for management of stress urinary incontinence in UK. Recently, it had been changed to the Persh colpo suspension, abdominal procedure to elevate the neck of bladder. Why? According to the statistics and reviewing audits of TVT post-operative complications, uh, in comparison to the results, the UK NICE guideline discovered that the outcomes are not that good on the long run. Patients are suffering from mesh or tape complications like erosion, infections, and most urgently, dyspareunia and severe pain during intercourse later. And this problem is not solved well. So the TVT recently, the, the work with TVT recently is suspended. And TVT is not the first line management for SUI anymore for part two MRCOG examination. But please, if you have some friends who will attend part three MRCOG, TVT is conflicting issue. So in part three, if you will discuss this issue with the rule player or with the examiner face to face, you have to say that Birch Colpo suspension nowadays is upper hand in the management of SUI, but TVT is still in debate and need more or further investigations and audits and statistical analysis to confirm the availability and credibility of TVT in the management of SUI. Don't ever, never attack or ignore the rule of TVT in SUI. I, I just, I just, <laughs> I just talked to, I just talked to uh, all of you regarding this point, just to understand that there's some important points to differentiate between part two and part three. Part three is reflecting your practice. Part two is reflecting your knowledge. And in knowledge, you need to be very sharp and very targeted in your answers. While in practice, you should be more flexible because there is no 100% true answer and no 100% wrong answer. The management should be individualized. Yes, in part two questions, you will choose directly Persh Colpo suspension as a primary management, surgical management for SUI problems, okay? There are some other types we can see here. We can, there are some other types of uh, um, surgical interventions. TOT is out of, of our scoop in MRCOG curriculum because TV, TOT is already under trials and not used uh, according to our curriculum. T, TOT is associated with horrible side effects, is associated with permanent gluteal pain in around 30% of patients. Gluteal pain, very sharp pain, interfere with sitting. So 
you should not ever, never mention TOT. In recurrent cases, all very weak patients who are unfit for surgery, unfit for surgery, paraurethral bulking agent injection. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm just answering this question right now. <laughs> A paraurethral bulking agent injection is the ideal option in the cases of recurrent symptoms after surgical management or for those patients who are not uh, fit for major surgery or refusing surgery, major surgery, okay? The third line management, if the patient refusing surgery or unfit and she's insisting and suffering a lot from the symptoms, you may offer her a medical treatment as a third line. The medical treatment here is called duloxetine. And duloxetine is adrenergic receptor agonist for beta-3 receptors. Scientists in discover that bladder is bladder bladder is full of uh, beta-3 receptors, about 95% of receptors are beta-3. So the diloxetine will working on adrenergic receptors beta-3 in the bladder and will help more the patient to control her symptoms and increasing the urethral pressure so that regaining again the valvular mechanism of the bladder. Now, let me ask you a question, sir, for diloxetine need MDD or M? Okay, yeah, this is my question actually, but I will go previously for a while. After pelvic floor muscle exercise, and the patient is not improved, what is your next step in her management? I need suggestions. Surgery. Surgical management. Surgical management. Surgical. MDT. To MDT. The patient uh, conditions, her age, her uh, fertility. Okay. So the point here is, if you remembered my, what I said very well, you will remember that I have to do urodynamics. If the pelvic floor muscle exercise failed, the next step is surgical management. But before surgical management, I have to do two important things. I have to send the patient to urodynamics and I have to refer the patient to multidisciplinary team. They will be more able to choose the ideal procedure and to evaluate the condition again. So this is one of the points that you may miss when you are answering single best answer questions. You will go directly for surgical management. Yes, it's true, but you need to prepare for this surgical management. How can I prepare? By multidisciplinary team and doing urodynamics. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Hassan? Yes, sure. Yeah, Dr. Hassan, uh, but according to a new guideline, they said that if it's a pure stress incontinence, you will not go for a urodynamics. No need. You can go directly for the surgical management. That's why we said that the multidisciplinary team and urodynamics should be offered. If there is an option in the exam for both, you would choose both. Even, even the guidelines said against. And if the symptoms, if the symptoms of the SUI is not clear, or the patient had a mixed symptoms with SUI and OEB, then you will choose urodynamics necessarily. Don't go for surgical management unless the patient is pure SUI after multidisciplinary team referral. Okay, is it okay. clear? Yeah, please. Yeah, clear. Okay. 
Okay, so you can notice that the major change in the Euro dynamic NICE guideline, the new one from the old one, is mainly in this point. What is the most important or ideal surgical management for SUI? And if the patient had a pure symptoms of SUI, pure symptoms, this means, by, by practical wise, this means patient had a strong history, uh, strong history for the risks of SUI. Patient is classically suffering from leakage with increased intra-abdominal pressure, no symptoms of frequency, urgency, or nocturia, or burning, or anything else. Okay? Then you can advise the patient through referral to multidisciplinary team according to the ideal option, which will be Birch abdominal colpo suspension. By the way, the Birch colpo suspension, if you would like to know more details, which are common questions as well, the Birch colpo suspension is done through abdominal route. It's extra peritoneal procedure. It means the peritoneum will never be opened you will enter extra proteinal pathway to the retropubic space. It's called a space of redsis or redsis space. In this space, you will insert your tape and then elevate the bladder of neck gently. The most common blood vessel to be injured, excellent, churny incision, low transverse incision is the classical incision type to be done with the um <laughs> so you burns all information rcg you burns all informations excellent okay so deep circumflex iliac is the commonest artery to be injured in this space and churny incision. A low transverse incision is the ideal option to gain entry for the retropubic space in a uh, Birch colpo suspension. Okay. Now, let's go to the another arm, which is the overactive bladder. Aha. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. You, you remember that the, the previous exam, this question is coming in previous exam. Yeah, this question is, was there in previous exam. We, we expected this question before together, all together. Perfect. So, yeah, don't forget, you can see here in front of you, don't forget MDT. Okay. Now, the urge incontinence or OEB. The, the, the functional problem should be managed, number one, lifestyle modification. This is a basic step. Whenever you are in the gynae paper, whatever the topic, please search for lifestyle modification first. Then, instead of pelvic floor muscle exercise, the problem here is not related to the pelvic floor muscles. The problem is related to the bladder muscle. So we will do a bladder retraining for six weeks by trained nurse. And we will wait for evaluation. Okay? Perfect. If the bladder retraining is not effective, so we will go for the next step. What is our main problem? It's functional. So no place to start with surgical management. You will manage through medical treatment. And in medical treatment, we have a classic line of treatment and new line. The classic line is called anti-mascarenic receptor treatments. Anti-mascarenics, they are famous treatments, including oxybutynin. Yes, thank you, Dr. Maha. Oxybutynin, first choice, to all conditions except the old frail woman 
because the oxybutynin will pass the blood brain barrier and lead to serious neurological uh, and mental problems. Teltrodine, darifenacine, trosbium, trosbium is the ideal option for old, frail women. And if the trosbium is not an option in the exam, so the answer will be darifenacine. Okay. How can we use the antimuscarinics? Antimuscarinics is very silly group of drugs because the side effects are about 88% will suffer from severe dry mouth and around 70 to 80% of patients will discontinue the treatment because they cannot endure the dry mouth anymore. Sir, in exam, if all free women want to choose between the trosbium, trosbium, if both are there, choose trosbium. If no trosbium, choose darifenacine. Okay. So we will offer the patient oxybutynin immediate release for four weeks and we will ask her to come back again to re-evaluate then stop at this point because questions in this point is very tricky if the woman is improved on the oxyputinine treatment because it's very effective she will continue okay if the woman is not improved on oxybutynin treatment, you will offer changing the treatment to another antimuscarinic option, either sulfinacine, teltrodine, whatever. If the woman is improving, but she cannot tolerate the side effects, but she's fine. She feels that she's very fine right now, but the side effects going to make her insane. Then this woman should continue on oxybutynin patch, transdermal patch. Yes, thank you. Transdermal patch. So take care to differentiate when to change the oxybutynin overall and when to change oral oxybutynin to transdermal oxybutynin. Okay? Perfect. Four weeks later, the woman is coming back after changing the oxybutynin to another line and she said no improvement. The next step is to give her two medications together. For example, Tiltrodine and darifenacine, for example, okay? And see her again after four weeks. She come again after four weeks and she will say no improvement. Then you may offer her the new line medical treatments, which is called Mirapigron, okay? The Mirapegron is uh, the new medication in the market, I think starting from 2016 to be approved through the FDA in Guinea, in Uruguayne problems. And it's very effective. Although we have some instructions to use the Mirapegron. Yeah, we have some yeah, restrictions to be used. Uh, the most common side effect of Mirapigron will be a facial and lip edema. Yes, and the most serious side effect, it may affect the cardiac patients and deteriorating the cardiac condition. Okay. 
is multidisciplinary team is needed is needed before giving a patient mirapegron choice yes or no rcg said yes I said no right now uh -huh. any any other options anybody think that we need to ask multidisciplinary team prior to give the patient mirapegron no yeah i agree with all yeah yeah i agree with all of you the idea is you may ask your consultant but we are, you are not in need to ask multidisciplinary team the word multi or the term of multidisciplinary team is a, is a major thing okay multidisciplinary team in in large hospitals should be like a committee of consultants in a certain situation to discuss to reach the ideal option in treatment in investigations in plan of care and management or, and so on so this point you may ask your consultant only uh, otherwise no need for multidisciplinary team then if the whole medical treatments failed to uh, improve the patient condition then the next step in her management will be hmm now medical treatment is 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 failed to manage the next step should be any suggestions the third line management of oab should be surgical management wrong you forget your dynamics you forget and multidisciplinary team before going from medical management to surgical management options you should offer the patient your dynamic studies and multidisciplinary team okay the surgical options are varied between botox injection nerve stimulation and two large procedures which are almost uh, not effective and very destructive procedures the outcomes is is bad augmentation cystoplasty and Can urinary diversion yeah dr wala uh, your voice very low okay now is now is better i think thanks now it, thanks. yeah okay thank you so now actually i am eating the mic the mic in inside my throat so uh <clears throat> okay um uh, let's discuss in simple words what are the most important questions in each surgical intervention for the first one botulinum toxin a or botox injection this procedure is done through cystoscopy injections will be occurred in 15 to 20 points in bladder muscle to initiate paralysis to in initiate muscle the trouser muscle paralysis and the trigone of the bladder should be preserved without injections why because if you inject the trigone the complete bladder paralysis will occur and then the patient will suffer from obstruction she will not be able to evacuate bladder because the evacuation process requires contractions then no contractions in the trigone so the patient will suffer from acute urinary obstruction when you are discussing the botulinum toxin a injection to the to the woman you should tell her that there is a risk of acute urinary obstruction and due to the paralysis and then the patient should accept 
the only way management for the acute urine retention in her condition, which is self-intermittent clean catheterization. Clean, intermittent self-catheterization, CISC. If you are in love with abbreviations, so this is the abbreviation of clean intermittent self-catheterization. Sometimes in some questions and scenarios, the woman is very afraid from obstruction and she asked you to minimize her risk. The NICE guideline recommends that the ideal uh, um, amount of putulinium toxin A, which will never be or, or, or less associated with paralysis and acute urine retention will be 100 units of putulinium toxin. 100 units. Okay. Then the, yeah, I, I, I'm just reading the chat room because I missed some. All of you are smiling. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the next step is uh, with putulinium toxin. Yeah, when we uh, will discuss the putulinium toxin again, we will give all of you some more details. Sometimes you may face silly questions, so we will discuss these details later. The second, the second option, Dr. Saima. Okay, yeah, thank you, Dr. Saima. The second option is posterior TPL or sacral nerve stimulation. And actually the guideline is writing both in different sites. In, in the first site he talked to uh, about sacral nerve stimulation and the, in the another site he talked about uh, posterior tibial nerve stimulation. So what should you choose? In the exam, I never experienced conflict in in any version of MRCOG exams regarding this question. It's very difficult to find both options in the same question. But if you are you are unlucky guy, and this question is coming in the exam, you would choose sacral nerve stimulation as uh, the sacral nerve stimulation is. The sacral nerve is, is a large nerve, so the effect of stimulation will be higher and more effective than the posterior tibial. Although the posterior tibial is more superficial, but the effect of sacral nerve is higher. The other point is, uh, we have two options for nerve stimulation, transcutaneous and percutaneous nerve stimulation. Always choose percutaneous because transcutaneous is invasive and associated with other risks. So percutaneous is more effective and safer. So ideally, percutaneous is ideal, okay? If both injections of putulinium toxin A and nerve stimulation method both failed to manage your condition, then the third and fourth lines should be discussed. Augmentation cystoplasty is associated with uh, the procedure itself. We will take a part of the ileum and we will remove the old bladder and insert the new bladder uh, from the ileum after reconstruction. The problem is the most common complication or side effect of this procedure is uh, mucus urine, turbid mucoid urine all of the time. The patient will suffer later from urinary tract infections because the media is a breeding factor for development of bacteria. Why? Colaminar cells that are lining the uh, ileum is now 
responsible to deal with acidic urine. So turbidity and UTI is the most common complications. And the most serious complication with augmentation cystoplasty due to continuous irritation by acidic media to the collaminar cells, which are not responsible or cannot endure the acidic medium, malignant transformation is the most serious side effect of augmentation cystoplasty. It counts about 3% of patients. The last option is urinary diversion. And this procedure includes devascularization and de-innervation to the original bladder, then remove the two ureters and insert them in the colon. Okay, in the colon. Of course, the idea seems to be good to avoid the pathway and to avoid the problems of the trouser muscle. But in fact, this procedure is horrible in the outcome. I saw this procedure once before, and the outcome of the patient was miserable as the um, the anal sphincter is programmed to control non-fluid materials, okay? That's why some people who suffered from severe diarrhea, they at some point could not achieve maximum control. The same idea with urine in colon. The patient will suffer later on from incontinence again because the anus sphincter is not uh, uh, tolerated well to control fluids. So finally, I always say that the patient of OEB is definitely unlucky. And I, I think from my practice, most of those people are suffering from somehow element of psychological problems. Because I can't imagine that anyone could go through augmentation cystoplasty, for example, because she suffered from some drops or she cannot uh, um, control herself well. Sometimes um, the psychological element is playing a great role with OEB patients. And always I say those patients are going to hell by themselves because she's always complaining and cannot, cannot improve uh, w with any line of management. Please, dear friends, remember that the terminologies, which is the best antimuscarinic, oxybutynin, immediate release, the first and best one. Please remember the terms. The terminology is very critical in all mm, in EMQs questions. So, if the patient is suffering from stress urinary incontinence and is, is diagnosed clinically, this is called the stress urinary incontinence. If the stress urinary incontinence is confirmed by urodynamics, the diagnosis will be urodynamic stress incontinence. If the overactive bladder is diagnosed clinically from symptoms of frequency and urgency only, okay, it's an overactive bladder. But if the overactive bladder is diagnosed and confirmed by urodynamic studies, then the diagnosis will be detrosor overactivity, not overactive bladder. The diagnosis change to detrosor overactivity. Very common in EMQs, very common. It's critical, yes. Hello? Okay. It's, uh, it's very, yeah, okay. Last exam. Okay, can you repeat that? 
Yeah, I will repeat. It's uh, okay. I will repeat. Yes. Uh, now you, you, you. If the stress incontinence is diagnosed, stress incontinence is the definition of diagnosis clinically of the condition. Okay. If the woman underwent urodynamics and the urodynamic studies confirming the stress urinary incontinence, then the diagnosis will be urodynamic stress incontinence, not stress incontinence alone. It will be urodynamic stress incontinence. On the other hand, if the diagnosis of overactive bladder established clinically, okay, this is an overactive bladder. If the diagnosis is confirmed by urodynamics, so this is a diagnosis of detrosal instability or detrosal overactivity. Okay? Uh, yeah, clear. Thank you. So uh, it's very important. Yeah, another question I remember that. The side effects of darifenacine and teltrodine is as same as the side effects of oxybutynin, which includes the most common side effect is dry mouth. They are acting like atropine. So, uh, bradycardia is one of the options. A constipation, constipation, and blurring vision, as the mirapegron also, blurring vision is the very critical side effect, and then you should stop treatment urgently and revise your doctors. Uh, 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 okay, now you are, all of you are discussing certain question. Let's read the question. Chan Man, last exam in EMQ, one question, doctor, yes. Better capacity 250, okay. First void, okay. Okay, bladder capacity. Now, bladder capacity is 250 or 40 to 400 to 600. But there was no detrosal overactivity. First sensation. Aha, uh -huh, two separate questions. <laughs> okay. I will answer the first question with Dr. Sean uh, now. In options, there was a bladder fibrosis. Okay. The major difference between the three types, and this is, will be discussed in regular course, because in the regular course, we will put some charts and ch some examples for urodynamics. But let me answer you simply regarding the differences between uh, the different conditions. You have three lines of pressures in the urodynamics. The first line is abdominal pressure, the second line is vesicle pressure, and the third line is detrosal pressure. And you should look upside in that graph if there is a leakage or not. So patient with increased abdominal pressure associated with increased vesicle pressure with no change in detrosal pressure and no leakage the answer is normal person. Anyone will do a valsalva, then intravesical pressure will increase, but because of the trouser muscle compliance, no leakage, no increase in the trouser pressure, this is the action of normal personnel. If there is a leakage by, with the same picture of graphs, this is a stress urinary incontinence. Leakage equals stress urinary incontinence. And that's why leakage is critical to diagnose stress urinary incontinence, while it's not part of diagnosis for detrosal overactivity, because it may be wet or dry in, in overactive bladder. It may be wet with leakage or dry without leakage. So how can I diagnose overactive bladder? The overactive bladder is associated with raised intra-abdominal pressure, okay? Raised vesicle pressure accepted because both are similar to each other. And changes in 
it throws their muscle pressure. It should exceed 15 centimeter water to diagnose the trouser overactivity. So the, the most critical line of pressure you should notice carefully in the exam is the trouser muscle pressure. Now, some, some hints regarding, uh, I, will, I will answer your question, Dr. Chan, don't, don't, don't afraid. I will answer your question regarding the five process, but I, I'm trying to give you the idea step by step. Sometimes there are no urodynamic graphs and um, the problem is the interpretation of the results, the maximum bladder capacity, the trouser muscle pressure, the cycle pressure, and so on. So in the stress urinary incontinence, bladder capacity should be normal from 400 to 600. For book, for book, 300 to 500. This is the maximum bladder capacity. And the first sensation or desire to micturate should be at 150 milli. So, with overactive bladder, the bladder maximum capacity should be very low below 300 sure below 300 because of frequency and market irritability the only other condition associated with marked decrease of maximum capacity is bladder fibrosis bladder fibrosis the urodynamic graph will appear as increased intra-abdominal pressure increase vesical pressure regularly and rise the trouser pressure but not in a spike manner it will not like a spike the rising will be gradual gradual and then it will be plateauing so a plateau rising plateau the trouser pressure yes Yes, of course. So plateauing is the characteristic finding of bladder fibrosis. And it's, of course, associated with decreased maximum bladder capacity. And first sensation should be very early. Leakage is common due to of loss of control. Okay. This is a major thing. I have a, um, I have bought three courses here in Egypt, the circuit course on Saturday, the next Saturday, and uh, the Eurodynamic module. I put a question regarding the interpretation of Eurodynamics. <laughs> so uh, I think all of you should be familiar with certain issues like CTG, like Eurodynamics, like. Um, consent, uh, uh, maternal dashboards, these things are, are very, very critical in your practice. Now, we have a time to open discussion and to, yeah, this, this, and any questions. So let's go through questions step by step. RCUG is asking, so in five process OEB, how to differentiate? It will be increased sustainedly and the history will make a change. For example, if you would like to differentiate between two scenarios, you should go very systematic. Look to the history. In the five process, you will find the history of, for example, the history of uh, radiotherapy, for example, or severe chronic infections. In the uh, OEB, you will find classic history with no certain issues. From the aerodynamic studies, Increasing the trouser pressure, increasing the trouser pressure will be associated in both conditions, but the major difference is leakage and urgency, leakage and urgency with overactive bladder. In the fibrosis, the patient is, although the trouser pressure is very high active, 
but the sensations are very low due to extensive fibrosis. So there is no extra feeling regarding the sensations of micturation. The normal flow rate, sorry, yes, another question is, yes, in that question, first voice sensation was, yeah, exactly, exactly. It's, it's, it's something like related capacity of the bladder to the amount the bladder can carry on, okay? And yeah, this is a very, very good example. The overactive bladder is similar to the uterus in early pregnancy in a primary gravida woman. When the embryo is implanted inside the uterus, the uterus is trying hardly to expel the contents with small contractions, as same as the bladder itself. With irritated detrosor muscle, minimal amount of urine will initiate the involuntary contractions, then the patient should be, will be in need to evacuate urgently. And this is the classic picture of urge incontinence. Dr. Josephine, what is the normal flow rate uh, per second? 20, 20, the rule of 20. 20 meter per second, and complete evacuation with adult person should be within 20 seconds overall. 20, 20. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. So, of course, this is a good idea about the uh, urodynamics overall, but um, still, we have many tricks in urodynamic questions itself related to the exam. We still need to discuss the painful bladder syndrome. We still need to discuss some important points in urinary tract infections, and as well as the Volt prolapse guideline many, many other issues under the module of urogynecology. Uh, in, in our free session today, let me apologize first, apologize for uh, the lag which, is, which has occurred in the first of the session with issues in, in voice and in connections. Please all of you accept my apologies and thank you for your patency and for waiting uh, until the reconnection is established again. The second point is, I hope this free session will make a small difference in your mind towards the certain points uh, uh, and different questions uh, for different urinary incontinence types. Let's go through this question. In stress incontinence, can you repeat the change in intra-abdominal and intra intra Okay, in stress incontinence, increasing intra-abdominal pressure with sneezing, coughing, lifting heavy objects will be associated automatically with increased intra pressure. intra pressure or detrosor muscle pressure will never change. No increase in detrosor pressure and leakage should be demonstrated on the graph. Otherwise, if no leakage with the same graph picture, this is a normal person. Normal person. Thank you. So uh, we have still a lot to do together. Too many options, uh, in too many topics, too many ideas, too much tricks, and too much joyful moments to spend together. The better source to cover your gynae is from NICE guideline, the new edition, 2018, August. This is the ideal source. Please, when you are reading any guideline, my advice is don't waste your time in details. Just try to be very simple. Try to read the summaries as much as you can. The bold lines uh, inside the guideline, get away from the statistical studies and comparative studies and all of these things. Don't waste your time. And Prepare yourself after reading this guideline and I expect or I need to discuss 
all your queries after reading this guideline in our regular core session of urogynecology. So, uh, any other questions? Anybody you would like to ask about anything regarding urinary incontinence? Any questions? Wow. It, it, it means either the, the topic is very easy or I'm very good teacher. <laughs> so, if no questions, let me, um, yeah, let's see this question. Doctor, is the salmon enough? Uh, yes, yes, uh, more than enough. Are the graphs in exam in the same sequence? Yeah, the graphs are, are, are almost very classic, and we will train very well about these, these uh, uh, graphs. So you will never find anything, wow, change or major problem or a major strange thing. You will find nothing. Abdominal, yeah, the classic finding regarding this. So how mm -hmm. to deal with the patient with fistula? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you, doctor. Uh, I'm just reading the, the last question. I will contact you to okay. ask, to listen to you. Yeah, thank you. Sir, how to deal with a patient with fistula? You can imagine that this is a major station in part three. A patient with fistula, okay. Fistula is uh, an iatrogenic problem, mo mostly an iatrogenic problem, unless the patient suffering from a terminal stage of cancer and the cavity of bladder uh, opened on the vagina uh, by, by infiltration or something. So it's an iatrogenic problem. Any problem caused by medical team staff, it requires deep breathing to the patient. You have to talk to the patient and her family. You have to apologize a duty of candor. You have to apologize and to confess that some problems occurred with the procedure. And the confirmation of the fistula should be done either by three cotton swabs test or directly through a cystoscopy. IVU may play a role, but cystoscopy will be more helpful and more effective and recommended to evaluate the size and site of the fistula. Some fistulas could be managed by only conservative management. If it's small, and, um, and not in an effective or critical area, like trigone, for example. It could be managed conservatively and it will heal spontaneously. But if large size or in a critical point, then surgical management should be obtained after three months of the event of fistula to ensure complete subside of edema and infections, okay? Management and techniques are not required in this exam. The most important point to remember is multidisciplinary referral to your for cystoscopy and management. The initial management for it, for any new case diagnosis with fistula is catheterization and prophylactic antibiotics. Catheter insertion and prophylactic antibiotics. This is how can you manage uh, the fistula rapidly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Dealing with fistula, thank you so much, doctor. Side effects of metapegron. Cardiac are the most serious complications, arrhythmias and cardiac failure. And the most common side effects, including facial and lipedema, blaring vision, headache, and nausea. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, who uh, would like to open the mic and ask the question? I, I'm ready. I'm sorry for, for postponing your, your uh, question, doctor, but I was reading the questions in the chat as well. So if you still have any questions, please open your mic and uh, I will be very happy to listen to this. Assalamu alaikum, Wa alaikum salam. Uh, yes, this is Dr. Suparna, if you remember. Oh, hello, Dr. Suparna, wow. <laughs> yes. How are you? 
very sad to not pass again with 1% again failure second paper i cleared but the first one with sds cleared but emqs left 1% again but it's okay um, alhamdulillah <laughs> it's kind of just about um, because of the <laughs> i know i know how much how much uh passing the exam or not passing the exam by 1% is very very stressful Yes. Uh, I can I can imagine your feelings because I passed through the same experience before. Yes. And uh, yeah, I can I can imagine that. Uh, I'm sorry for that because you deserve. I think uh, yeah. God is preserving the best for you in the ideal time. I it's hope just so. a, it's just a matter of time. Don't worry Thank about you. this. I believe in you. I believe in you. Yes. Yes, I'm sorry to ask you some stupid questions, but they came last time, which made me little disturbed because uh, there are discussions among the groups also. Aged uh, 60 to 65 years, if a lady is there, and uh, she, if they don't mention old frail word, do we give derifenacin or uh, rospium? Because a uh -huh. lot of people said uh, it should be uh, derifenacin or rospium only. So. Is this word uh, old frail important? Is the keyword for uh, trospium? So, yeah, or the, is free, it... the frail woman is a keyword. That is for trospium. Whether darifenacin yeah. is given or not given. Darifenacin is an option, uh, the second option, if the trospium is not there. But if trospium is there, so trospium would be superior. Superior. Okay. And yeah. if it is just 60 or 65 years, they have not mentioned about old frail, then the drug of choice no. definitely would be uh, told already. 60, 65, 60, and 65 is not old frail. If the question is not mentioning she's old and frail, don't mm -hmm. assume that she's old and frail because she's 65. Okay, this is a, yeah, this is a major problem in UK actually. The age of woman is very conflicting, even for us as a, as an uh, Egyptians. Uh, 65 for Egyptian point of view is too old. Okay, and uh, in UK, 65 is average, and you have to ask her about the uh, sexual life, if she is sexually active or not, and you should respect her wishes towards one, two, three. In our countries, in our, in our practice, we are far away from this point. So don't imagine that 70 years old is old frail okay, okay. it doesn't okay. matter the, the question so the should be so the choice definitely will be tortured in all definition for as you said if old frail hello yeah yes yes doctor supon i can hello? hear you yes i can hear you okay Yes, perfectly. Actually, as you said, exactly. Okay, doctor. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Hi, Dr. Hassan. This was the first time I attended your lecture, and so it was nice. I have joined your course. I'm looking forward to that on, on you, etc. Sure. Uh, doctor, doctor. Uh, so, partner, I think that the, there is a, some problems in the connection. I can't hear you well. I can't hear you well. Hi, Dr. Hassan. This is Dr. Memuna. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you very well. Sorry, Dr. Supana, I think the, the, the voice is not well with you, so uh, we cannot hear you very well. Please, if you have any questions, just write on the chat or try to relog again if possible. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Maimoun, how are you? I'm good, alhamdulillah, Dr. Hassan, and uh, it's a pleasure to just attend the lecture. It was very nice the way you explained everything. I actually took half of it. I was a little busy at the end, but I would love to, you know, continue and learn a lot from you guys. Um, I just want to appreciate the work you are doing. 
uh, someone recommended me you, but uh, you're like group Sidra and you. But after listening to you guys, I'm honestly thinking that you're doing amazing job. Thank and, you so uh, much. Uh, I think I think all of you. This this group is a good group and will improve more and more by effort of every member. Not only me, not only Sidra. We should all cooperate together to uh, learn each other and gain the maximum benefit from each other uh, because mm -hmm. believe me the, the the as i said before the treasure nothing to reach the target only the treasure yeah. through the journey the people mm -hmm. you know the informations you gain the the skills yeah. you learn everything so you all of you should put this in your minds this is the this is very, the point very true and it's like a family will all be meeting again and again. Um, just one thing I wanted to confirm. See, when we get the access of the, this uh, course, um, is it only available online when you have internet or because I have to travel to uh, like some course in Germany and Dubai? So will this be available when I'm offline or is it just online when I have the internet no, access? No, no, no. The, the, the recordings of all sessions will be mm -hmm. regularly uploaded on the med exam site and you'll be able to listen to any session anytime either okay. online or, or if you are not alive cannot uh, attend the online session you can hear it completely offline okay this is so we can yeah. hear it offline as well that's nice and one yeah. more thing the when you open the course there are some headings given and under that there are some lectures or something so are those the guidelines itself or are like i they were saying you have the access to talk and uh, guidelines and everything so is are those the one or is there something separate than that we have uh, summaries for green top guidelines, nice guidelines, and togs. Summaries are available on the site. But always, I recommend everyone, if you still have time, and you have time until the date of the exam, if you are able to read the guideline yourself, mm -hmm. it would be better before reading the summary. Because okay. you should be familiar with the guidelines. You should be familiar with the language, with the expressions, with the sequence and systematic thinking. Okay, it will be very helpful. Otherwise, if you are very busy or cannot mm -hmm. uh, uh, read the guidelines regularly, you mm -hmm. should only revise the flow charts and diagrams, tables inside the guideline. Otherwise, the summary will cover everything. Yes, this was one very important point you mentioned to us also because I feel, uh, you know, panicked when the, you open one guideline, it's so long. But you said that reading only highlighted points is like usually enough. Unless you have time, you can go into details. Yeah, okay. Uh, highlighted and, and bold uh, informations oh. are the most important informations. Regarding yeah. the small informations between sentences, this is mm -hmm. our job. So, so yeah. if, if, if you are afraid from the small informations, don't worry about this. This is our job, actually. And oh. we are here to give you the small tricks, not to, to okay. explain the guideline. We are here to give you the small tricks. Okay. All right. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Hassan. Thank you. And, Thank you. Uh, Thank you. We'll see you again when the meeting starts. When, when are we starting this course? Like 16th of this 16th month? 16th of September, yes. On Monday, next Monday. And the timings would always be the same, starting at 6? Uh, like, oh, yeah, I, I, I think, I think uh, regarding my sessions, it will be the mm -hmm. same time, uh, okay. which, which may be modified according to your wishes, all of you uh, uh, slightly modified. Uh, yeah. I will I will revise the schedule again with Dr. Sidra and if you have any wishes or any certain points you would like to discuss, don't hesitate to inform us directly and we will try to afford the maximum luxurious <laughs> surfaces yeah. ever as much as we can. Because the timings which are given by you, I live in Bahrain and in Bahrain, like your timing, three o'clock is six here and my clinic starts from like uh, 4.30 to 8 again. 
So the time when it's the lecture time, it's like the clinic time I'm busy. So that's why I was thinking like how I can cope up every time I'll have to miss the lecture. If one hour late or something, if possible, like uh, considering everyone's situation, obviously, but that would be preferable. If possible. Okay, let, let, let me discuss this point with the team and the friends uh, on, the, on the group and we will try to reach the maximum of, uh, uh, acceptable time, inshallah soon, inshallah. Okay. Uh, I think we finished. Uh, thank you so much, so, so much for attending this session and I was very happy to see all of you uh, we will we will meet again soon, and I hope the next session uh, in the regular course will be great and uh, effective and sufficient. All the best for all of you, my dear friends, and try to do your best to cover the Urugaini uh, module until the next session of Urugaini. Thank you so much, so much for attending. Sorry. How to open the GTG summaries? Yeah, this is, this is you can ask Dr. Haider about the technical problems. Dear, can you please show us the curves of this SUI and trouser to make it clear? Uh, th this, will be, this will be with the, the, another presentation on the regular course, actually. Uh, sir, your advice, uh, 60%, uh, what the hell. Better to be in February or July. Sure in February. Sure in February. You are almost, you are almost successful candidate. 60%, 1% doesn't fail, doesn't mean you are failed. 60% uh, means you are unlucky. <laughs> so yeah, definitely you are unlucky. Not a, not a, a failed candidate. So you, sure, just, just, uh, um, Kick it down in, in February. Don't hesitate. The lecture was really good. Thank you so much and thank you for all of you. Uh, and hope to see you soon in the first lecture um, in the next week. All the best of all of you and have a nice day. Thank you so much, so much. See you later. Bye bye. Hello. Yes. Uh huh. I'm just I'm just closing. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Lata, how are you? Hello, I'm Dr. Lata. I want to I buy your course now today night. So it is possible to I join today? Yes, please, please. Uh, just just contact Dr. Hassan Haider on the Met Exam Experts, and he will accept your your request as soon as possible. And you will you, you we will be very happy to join us. Of course. Thank you. So I will buy today night. Is it possible? Yeah, I think it's possible. Just contact Dr. Haider. He will accept all payments and everything. Okay, so I will send the email. Yeah, just I will go the uh, mid exam expert. Oh, application. Exactly. 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 Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank Dr. You. Lada. Thank you so much. Okay, have a nice day. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, thank you, all of you. How to get access to videos? The same, according to the website. Um, if, you, if you, all of you, if you have any problems with the technical issues, just go directly, send a message to Medexam IT team or to Dr. Hassan Haider directly, and he will respond as soon as possible, will help you how to manage your accounts on the Facebook group because actually I'm uh, like um, um, an idiot <laughs> in the management and technical issues. I have no idea and experience in this way. Uh, the, yeah, join room, study room, you will receive uh, a request on the Facebook, just click accept to join the study room, okay? The lecture will be uploaded tomorrow, maximum the day after tomorrow. When I try to join, it says close group. Yeah, actually it's close group. You should receive invitation. And the invitations will be sent uh, uh, within two days from now. Yeah, sure. Okay, Dr. Rizwana, thank you so much. I hope I was uh, 
clear as much as I can. And um, thank you again. I'm speechless for this very, very high attendance uh, uh, rate. And I hope we will achieve success all together. Thank you and have a nice night. Bye-bye.